Hello and welcome to the first inaugural Social Work Action Network International Conference. Um, we're very pleased to be able to start this conference and it's a very exciting time for us. Um, over the last year, we've been discussing how we can build radical social work and engage in radical politics around the world and, and, and to, to, to influence some of the debates and uncertainty um, that's, been, that's been happening. We've got a really exciting lineup over the course of the next three days, and I'm so happy to announce that we've had over 2,600 people sign up to the conference. And it's a truly international conference from the US down to Latin America, to Japan, to New Zealand, to Australia, to Sweden, to UK, to South Africa. This is a truly international event. So thank you for joining us. Today's session to kick off the conference is going to be Social Work in Contemporary Crisis. And I'm very glad to have three wonderful speakers here today, um, one of which is Michael Lavalet and uh, Reverend Dr. Michelle well uh, Walsh. But our first speaker is Pawana Amiri. She is a author, she is a poet, and she's an Afghan refugee based in, in, um, in Greece. So the way the session is going to start, each speaker is going to speak for 10 minutes. And then we're going to open up to participation, questions, contributions from all the people around the world. If you go to the Facebook live stream or the YouTube live stream, you'll be able to add questions, be able to add any comments or show solidarity. And what we will do is then we'll try and feed these back to our speakers and try and get as many questions in as possible. So let's kick off and I'm going to ask Prawana to, to start us off. In the name of Allah, hello to all audiences, participants and of this event. Uh, at the moment, I am giving uh, this uh, conversation from Ritsona Camp. And I am really happy to have this opportunity of sharing the, uh, con about the condition and about the affection of the uh, pandemic through our life and especially through those that has been vulnerable but has never got uh, as much attention as they could get. Uh, Ritsona is a camp that... Uh, uh, during the pandemic and in the beginning of the COVID crisis, we had 26 positive cases of the um, virus. But despite our expectations, we could achieve less attention from out world. Communication and the resistance of the inhabitants has been the only way to show our to show our existence and to become visible. But of course, I want to highlight the. Uh, affection of the uh, solidarity chains of the um, people that they have uh, collaborated with us in order to become visible and to be heard. But all this has never uh, been the main reason to control the condition. As the condition has never been controlled and managed, and the only thing that has changed is that we became more vulnerable than before. But is this vulnerability a case of becoming more visible and heard? No, it has been absolutely uh, denied from us, and we are faced with many empty promises to get our uh, demands, but we could, but we haven't gotten them. Uh, during this, uh, I want to highlight uh, uh, about our condition during the COVID, because we have never faced with such a uh, condition, and it was totally, uh, it was totally new experience for us to become to be in the camps. To become uh, to be a refugee, to live in the camp and have uh, uh, you know have the pandemic among ourselves, but not be able to speak out about uh, our condition. I would really like to have uh, to speak out about the narrative behind this condition. But instead of that, I want to highlight the issue of networking that we could uh, uh, make some positive changes in our life. For many of us, and especially for the refugees. Uh, we have never had the hopes that we have and the strength that we are, uh, you know, going and trying to continue our way. But this hope and resistance came from those people that have stood in solidarity with us. Those that have been uh, with us, not the corporations, authorities or the state. And instead of uh, getting, um, and instead of... Uh, uh, from those that we were expecting to get uh, um, answers in, on, on our demands and especially about our problems, we faced uh, uh, the, um, some broken promises that it reduced the hope that we were expecting to uh, have to 
have a better condition um, to change our condition in a better way. But then instead of has the networking that we have, that we could communicate through the uh, social media, through the, uh, you know, through the different events, through the panels, it helped us to become uh, visible and heard. Uh, so to say, it was the media that helped us to speak out about our problems. Otherwise, we would stay hidden and trapped and invisible uh, up and until now. Uh, but uh, of course, the actions that has been taken from those that they were, um, that they had the idea of making change through the communications helped us to uh, also get the strengths of acting as well. Uh, so, but uh, through all this, um, through all these years that we were uh, called as a vulnerable group of people who are living in uh, different conditions, and during the pandemic that we faced that this uh, vulnerability should become more uh, highlighted and remarkable, we could not get it. Uh, but we are hoping to use our networking, our, uh, the social actions and the solidarities that we have behind ourselves to make it happen. Uh, it was all from my side. I really hope to speak more, but I think uh, the limitation of time uh, will not allow me. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and I will be really glad to answer to your uh, questions. So, Anne, you've still got a few minutes left if you'd like to say some more. Oh, really? I would really like to have the um, questions and speak, like, to answer the questions because like that, I, it would be much easier for me to, you know, cover the conversation because, you know, the conditions that we are living in, it is not only about the, the affection during the crisis, but also what we are living in now, like the mental issues and the mental problems that we are facing now, that the... Uh, uh, before this, the mental problems was what has been the main uh, the main reason that made uh, that separated the uh, group of refugees one from each other, and it was one of the main reasons for the refugees to become transferred from one camp to another camp and to uh, like have better access to at least uh, uh, physical um, you know uh, comfortable physical uh, life, but. Now, even it is not uh, acceptable because we are all now as vulnerable people, those that they are for us, that we are not able to follow, to be followed with the, with the rules and with the laws because we are not able to follow the news or to know that what is going on, on the, uh, internationally and uh, in other countries and what is wrong and right and whatever is coming to our uh, life, we should accept that. And it has been always a problem for us because when we are not able, uh, aware about the uh, condition and we are not able to speak out about the things that are coming out in our life and like affect us on a, uh, you know, in a negative way and we are not able to speak out about that or share it, then this is the problem that uh, uh, makes us more affected by the condition. But... Uh, it is also another. Um, it is also another problem that uh, having no access to education, not being able to integrate in the society, not being able to act and to raise our voices, is also made, made us to stay repressed and to only follow up the rules that is coming out in our life and affect and impact on our daily life. So, I will be really glad to answer to your questions because you know. The topic of uh, speaking about the affection of crisis is for me a book that should be written like uh, one by one, having the testimonies of the people. But when it comes to the idea of having uh, radical um, social work, it is like re having resistance, sustainab sustain sustainability, and also continuous works and communication with those that they they are affected by the conditions and for those that they are, they are trying to make change. So this is the, um, I think this is the main highlighted, this should be the main highlighted topic because it has been all, all, only the networking and the social uh, communications that we have had. And it has been always a hope for us to see the change that I see I think that it has happened in some, some ways, but it still needs more uh, resistance, communications, and networking to make it more, uh, you know, more expanded. And 
yeah so and yeah i mean one of the key points you pulled out there was about the isolation and already being isolated and then this this pro the last year has only exacerbated and fueled already really harmful situations to a point of of further crisis um, and that's why it's so important and i'm really glad that you were able to open up the conference for us to put those term to put those, to put that message out there because um we're here for for engaging with the way it is possible and and in your your story is, is part of us finding a solution and resistance to to the structures that don't allow people to to engage and um, before i bring in my next speaker someone kindly reminded me i didn't introduce myself <laughs> at the start there's always something when you're doing live streams isn't there um, my name is Rory Anderson. I, I'm a frontline social worker and I'm also part of Social Work Action Network in Scotland. Um, our next speaker is Reverend Dr. Michelle Walsh. Um, she is a licensed independent clinical social worker. She's a lecturer at uh, Boston University School of Social Work. Um, uh, and she, sorry, she's also ordained in Unitary Universalist Faith Position. And both her social work and her clergy identities inform her values and activism uh, in the larger world from the pr perspective of collective liberation. Um, she is also the author of uh, Violent Trauma, Culture and Power, an Interdisciplinary Exploration into um, in Lived Religion. So I'm going to bring in Michelle now. Yeah, that transition to Zoom, uh, unmuting and, and muting. Hello, everybody. I am so honored to be with you today and to be part of this uh, conference and the international scope of the work that SWAN does on behalf of social work and radical social work. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here and share the space with um, these other wonderful panelists. Um, and I, I totally get the, uh, uh, the need to be relational about this. How do we do this on Zoom and how do we um, connect with, with questions. So uh, the way that I'm gonna do this is by sharing some stories with you. My spouse is of indigenous Texas Cherokee heritage, and he is also a Unitarian Universalist clergy person. I hold the dual identities with social work, and he preaches regularly on the topic of indigenous wisdom in light of climate change and climate crisis. And I wanna problematize that word for us in terms of what does it mean when we say crisis and climate crisis? And we need to really have a deeply rooted contextualized understanding of that language. So with his permission, I'm sharing a couple of stories with you to begin with this morning. Um, the first is from, there is a haunting scene in Zora Neale Hurston's important novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. One afternoon, the protagonist Janie sees Seminole Indians passing through the swamp heading east. They warn that a hurricane is coming, but no one believes them. That night, the great Okeechobee hurricane struck, killing 3,000 in what remains one of the most devastating natural disasters. The Seminoles had read the tall grasses in the swamps near Lake Okeechobee, where the lakes open into that river of grass we call the Everglades. They observe the sea pods swell and pop open, and they begin to leave the area, moving to higher ground. The Seminole said, the tall grass spoke to them. From generations of experience living in Florida, they had learned how their ecology behaved and how their ecology responded to different weather patterns. That experience allowed them to know that a hurricane was coming and their experience with hurricanes convinced them to evacuate to higher ground. And that was in 1928 before Doppler radar and mathematical models, which is how our scientific culture has learned to predict storms. They had no instruments, no computers, but they did have indigenous wisdom. They had what we might call seminal science. Looking forward in time, another story that I was drawn to um, happened in the tragic wake of the 2005 tsunami for much of Indonesia. Traditional knowledge had been passed down for generations to particular indigenous peoples on particular isolated islands. Their oral traditions taught them to move to higher ground and deeper into their forests when the earthquake first struck, with many surviving, while others who lacked this collective knowledge did not. And from yet another story in my spouse's collection, 
On the prairies west of the Missouri River, the Cato and Wichita people built very large houses made out of grass with cedar frames. Low to the ground, seen from a distance, they might be taken for a mound. Some of these structures were big enough to host the whole village for the dance ceremonies and games which, through which the community celebrated the sacred and enjoyed their community. The grass houses are both breathable and waterproof. The Cato and Wichita peoples had lived on the prairie for generations. They had experienced all kinds of weather in that open environment. They knew about the blizzard snows and the relentless sun of the summer. And they knew that prairies could see tornadoes. These big houses stood up to tornadoes and resisted being crushed by the snow. They had learned from their environment and built a sustainable relationship to it. They did not go to architectural school, but they had indigenous wisdom. Let the building be part of the prairie, they knew, with the prairie not against, with the prairie, not against the prairie. They practiced Cato and Wichita science. I share these stories as a spiritual practice for reorienting myself as a white woman, as a white woman with working class heritage, yes, but racially white with all the power and privilege that comes to that. It's a spiritual practice as a social worker and as a minister to reorient myself to the wisdom that is continuously offered by black indigenous and people of color around the world. And particularly indigenous peoples in these times of the climate crisis and their, the wisdom that they have in relationship to particular lands and particular communities. What does this mean for social work today? I'm fresh off of an incredible presentation by Autumn Asher Black Deer last night at the Boston University School of Social Work. It was part of the diversity and equity presentations that were happening. She's a member of the Cheyenne and Apaho tribes of Oklahoma and a doctoral candidate in social work at Washington University in St. Louis. Some of her key points included this very powerful quote, you cannot be the doctor if you are the disease. So we, in essence, we need to decenter Western white supremacy cultural ways of being and center indigenous wisdom alongside all in wisdom of black indigenous and people of color. What is the challenge for that when we live in an embodied way as white people, those of us who are racialized as white, how do we learn humility in these times and learn to follow the lead of black indigenous and people, people of color? She also spoke to the need for community driven research, not just a seat at the table of community participation research, but community driven research. How is the community empowered, given the tools of power, resources, decision-making, honoring fully and completely their own cultural ways of being. How do we do that as social workers in our research? And she recognized that culture is an ultimate intervention for healing. And for that, I would say for the healing of all of us. So in this sense, I experience myself as being part of a tradition that believes in collective liberation. Um, Chris Crass used that term in a book and he took it from Bell Hook's work and his book I highly recommend towards collective um, liberation. It does a hugely uh, wonderful uh, global history of social justice movements around the world. And he writes about from Bell Hook's um, Love is the Practice of Freedom in her book, Outlaw Culture. Uh, Bell Hooks wrote, until we are all able to accept the interlocking, interdependent nature of systems of domination and recognize specific ways each system is maintained, we will continue to act in ways that undermine our individual quest for freedom and collective liberation struggle. This is nowhere more evident to me than in how we are or are not working together and sharing wisdom around the climate crisis. So where in our social work curriculums are we engaging the practices and centering the knowledge of black indigenous and people, people of color, centering the power of local knowledge and cultural practices in taking the lead and particularly as we face again, the climate crisis. How are those of us racialized with um, white with economic power and privilege learning to yield to power and as Autumn said to us last night, get out of the way. How do we learn to seek to be in supportive partnerships at every point 
on the journey in these times, checking our egos in favor of collective wisdom. There are evidence-based studies of how significant wisdom arises from local communities around their specific needs and strengths, including from the climate crisis impact. You can Google the evidence project for their report on resilience and community response to climate related events and their study of four different case studies of community response to extreme weather events to illustrate community resilience in action. Drought in Ethiopia, flood in Mozambique, cyclone in the Philippines and a forest fire, forest fire in Indonesia. We need to know how to be, and we need the skills of being anti-racist and anti-oppressive in our approaches, including anti-capitalism and anti-colonial legacies. And these are all embedded institutionally and culturally in the structures of our society. How are we teaching and preparing in liberative ways for intersectionality of issues? And in this, I'm gonna to pivot to the impact on people living with disabilities. For example, from a United Nations report released for the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, they write that three things, three major impacts to be aware of. Disabled populations will most likely have limited access to knowledge, resources, and services to effectively respond to environmental change. Compromised health, particularly now also in the era of COVID, makes um, disabled people more vulnerable to extreme climate events, ecosystem losses, or infectious diseases. And those with disabilities are more likely to have difficulties during required evacuations or migrations. So again, the question I want to leave us with as radical social workers and human beings in general, you know, how do we challenge any of the internalized aspects of white supremacy culture and colonialism, particularly individualism and perfectionism? and lean into a cooperative and collaborative model of engagement and collective liberation. I'd like to end with um, a short story again from uh, indigenous uh, heritage of my husband. It's called the spider story. So I will quickly read this, hopefully I have time. In the very beginning when this world was just getting started, spider was sitting on a big basket and that basket was full of wisdom. Spider was beside herself with excitement because all this wisdom, she would be the smartest person in the world. Think of the advantage she would have over all the other creatures since she would be wise while they remained foolish. But what if someone found out and tried to steal some of her wisdom? I'll hide it in the top of the tallest tree, she decided. Then no one else will be able to look inside the basket and see what I have. It was rough going trying to walk on six legs and carry the basket in two of her spindly arms. She quickly became exhausted. Squirrel saw her struggling and suggested, well, why don't you fasten a strap around the basket and put it on your forehead so you can drag the weight behind you? That will make it easier to get up the tree. What? Spider stopped in her tracks. How did you think of that? I don't know, Squirrel shrugged, but that's the way I would do it. But I'm supposed to possess all the wisdom in the world, Spider sputtered. Spider thought she had been fooled and in a great tantrum, she heaved the basket and uh, the basket and wisdom scattered all over the ground. Wisdom spilled out everywhere, into the air, the water, into the earth itself. All animals flocked around and each carried off a little bit of it. The bear, the eagle, the cougar, and all the animals each captured a bit of good sense that would help them and their children stay alive. The trees stood still and drank deeply of the wisdom as it fed their ancient roots. In this way, wisdom came to be part of the world in rocks and wind and rivers and animals, and even in the two-legged ones that came along later. Each and every living thing has some wisdom to share if one only pays attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was wonderful. And it's really nice to bring in some of those stories, actually, to humanise it even further. But before I bring in um, our, our final speaker on the panel, I would just like to say, please comment, please ask questions to our panel, get the questions in, because we want to have as much participation, as much conversation as possible. 
Our final speaker of the panel before we bring open up to, to questions and answers is Michael Lavlet. Michael is a professor of social work at Liverpool Hope University, but he's also a co-founding member of Social Work Action Network in 2004. He's been an activist for many years um, and, and, and is an author of several books on radical social work. So Michael, bring in, I know you have some slides. So uh, thanks very much, Rory. Um, it's an absolute honour to share the platform with the speakers, but also to speak at the opening event of the Swan Eye Conference. It's really uh, an incredibly exciting and I think quite historic event in the history of radical social work. Um, as Rory mentioned, I'm going to share some slides. Um, and I just uh, thought I would uh, thought I would do that um, just to help with uh, with language issues around my accent because I'm from Scotland and sometimes people struggle with that. And um, what I thought I would do is that I would try to think about the themes that I think will structure the whole weekend. Um, and to do that, I thought I would um, structure that around what I've called four problems and a question. And um, I'm going to introduce what I think are the four main social problems uh, created by contemporary global capitalism and which pose questions for us as social workers. So there's the four problems. And then my, my last slide is just uh, some questions that I think that raises for social work in terms of how we progress and how we build the movements uh, to uh, promote and argue and fight for a better world. Um, so um, my first problem is climate change now. Michelle uh, has already mentioned uh, the, the, the climate crisis and, and given us a, a, a perspective on that. I just wanted to start off really uh, by, we've just got the latest figures really from 2020 and 2020 was the second hottest year on record. Um, you often say that, and say, well, what is on record? What does that mean? Well, we've been collecting records about the how hot the world is for 141 years and 2020 was the second hottest year. Um, but the bigger problem is that the last seven years have been the seven hottest years on record. Um, actually, every month in 2020, that month was in the top four hottest months ever recorded with the exception of December, which was the eighth hottest. So um, we clearly know that we have got a dramatic problem about what is happening in terms of uh, our, our world. It's getting hotter and the consequences of that are uh, uh, dramatic climate change. So again, 2020, let me give you some events. Um, there were 30 Atlantic hurricane events uh, in 2020. That's the largest number ever recorded. There were 13 major hurricane events, super uh, major hurricane events, the second highest on record. In the US in 2020, every mile on the East Coast from Texas to Maine at one point in 2020 was under hurricane or cyclone warnings at some point during the year. Um, if we think about wildfires, Australia, Canada, uh, uh, California, Arctic, all had their worst recorded wildfire season. In Philippines, there was the strongest super typh uh, typhoon uh, hit to hit the country in November. Um, the winds uh, were, a, were a sustained a pressure of 195 miles per hour. And in Death Valley in California, on the 16th of August, it uh, marked its highest recorded temperatures. The temperatures were 54.4 degrees Celsius or 129.9 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest ever recorded. And in China, we've had flooding that went on from June through September, which saw 1.4 million homes destroyed. We know this, but the climate crisis is getting uh, greater. Uh, and there are some commentators who suggested that because of the pandemic, the amount of carbon dioxide would reduce, and this would give us some kind of break. 
Well, it's certainly true that the amount of carbon dioxide we pumped out in the last year did reduce, but the overall CO2 levels in the atmosphere rose again up to 414 parts per million. We are now approaching the absolute tipping point in which it will be us entering the unknown. So I think, first of all, we have to start off with the way in which uh, capitalism is destroying our climate and destroying our communities and what we think we have to do about that. The second problem is, of course, the pandemic and the ecological crisis. And they are, of course, connected. They are not the same, but they are connected. Because partly the way in which we treat our world, the way that we treat our ecological systems, is creating the conditions for more pandemics. We are deforesting at a dramatic rate. We are poisoning our waters at a dramatic rate. We are, um, we are farming livestock in the most inhumane and horrendous ways. And all of that is creating the conditions within which new viruses will uh, adapt and the conditions within which new uh, viruses can jump from the animal world to human world, zoonotic transfer. Um, if we are seeing the end of COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm not sure that we are, but what we do know is that the pandemic of the last uh, year has caused the deaths of millions. We may get out of this pandemic, but unless we change how we treat our world, our ecology, the livestock that we farm, unless we do that, another pandemic is coming quickly our way. And this is rooted in the way in which we treat the natural world as a commodity, as a resource to be bought and sold, and assume that there is no consequence that comes with that. The third uh, problem that I want to identify is around poverty, unemployment and exploitation. Governments across the world have poured billions of pounds into uh, the uh, pandemic um, either relief or, uh, or through lockdowns or through privatisation of services. They have poured billions of pounds into those things. And of course, now they are telling us that we have to pay the bill. So a couple of things, if I may. The first one is there is absolutely no reason why the vast majority of the population of this world have to pay the bill. There are the 22 richest men in this world own more than all the women in the African continent put together. There are 2,153 billionaires in our world. They have more wealth than 60% of the global population. There is absolutely no reason why Paying for the resources of COVID has to be shared out, has to be played by the poorest, by those in work, by the working classes, by the dispossessed around the world. We could pay those bills very quickly by just taking some of the wealth of the fabulously wealthy. But it's absolutely clear that around the world, governments are going to try to shift the cost and shift the, 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 the bill for the pandemic, onto those who work, onto those who labour, onto those who are unemployed. The International uh, Labour Organisation um, estimate that um, the unemployment crisis as, as a result of COVID will rise, uh, will mean an unemployment rate of 8.1% in the Middle East. That's 5 million workers they expect to lose their jobs. In Europe, you think it will rise to 7.8%. 12 million workers will lose their job. In Asia and Pacific region, they reckon unemployment will be 7.2%. 125 million full-time workers will lose their jobs. These figures dwarf the outcome of the 2008 recession. And these are what governments are proposing unless 
we decide that we have to have an alternative. The fourth problem has been absolutely revealed, I think, in the last year. It has been revealed in the way in which COVID has operated. So we know that during the pandemic, it reinforced women's oppression. We know that if you were from minority communities, you were more likely to be ill and more likely to die. The pandemic didn't cause these things, but the pandemic revealed the reality of structural oppression and the consequences for people that we work with. Absolutely clear. And so during the last year, we have seen the response in the face of racism from state authorities and police. Do we go along with the police and the state authorities? In some parts of the world, we had social work organizations nodding in the direction of politicians who said that social workers should be lodged in police stations at a time when the movement outside the police station was arguing for the defunding of the police. Are we on the side of the protesters and the movements or are we on the side of the state and the state authorities and the police when that happens? In the UK, two weeks ago, when women protested sexual violence and murder of a woman by a police officer, the response of the police in the UK was to brutalise those women who were protesting in London in that way. So the final que uh, question, therefore, is whose side are we on? We face these four major problems. Whose side are we on? When women are fighting sexual violence, when they are fighting for reproduction rights, when they are fighting uh, for, uh, 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 against oppression uh, that has resulted on the lockdown, whose side are we on? When our colleagues in the black population are fighting against racist violence and taking to the street and being persecuted, whose side are we on? In Hong Kong, when people stand up and fight for their rights and are brutalized by the Chinese state, whose side are we on? In Australia, when people campaign against the effects of climate change and its crisis, whose side are we on? The side of big business and the coal capital, or are we on the side of those communities whose lives have been destroyed? And so it seems to me that over uh, this weekend, we will be looking at these issues. We will be looking at the problems of modern capitalism and the problems they create for those that as social workers we work with. We will be addressing the question, whose side are we on? And we need to think about how we draw alliances, how we draw together with people in the social movements as part of a campaign for a better social work and for a better world. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michael. And in, in what seems like quite a daunting task or a daunting prospects for the future actually requires resistance and organisation. And again, Social Work Action Network is not just a talking shop. It's not a place where we can come just come and share ideas. It's about building networks of resistance and cultures of resistance where we can actually engage in the social movements worldwide to actually affect some of that change. Um, and, and I suppose myself, along with that, social work is not is not separate to the situations that, and or the 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 the, uh, the crises within the world that actually has to interact, deal with them, and be part of the movements um, that are fighting them. So I've got a bit of many things going on at once going in my head. Um, just on that, um, my Hippos uh, uh, from the Philippines just made a comment when Michael was speaking there that that last year the Philippines ranked um, the second deadliest country for uh, environmental activists. They did not waver and then the environmental groups and they still continue to uh, campaign for climate justice, justice. And that's important because we can't let that, that movement stop. So we're, we're gonna come to the question section and thank you. Keep on sending your questions in. By no means just stop, keep, keep sending them in because you know we will be able to hopefully get back to them at a later date if we don't get back to them at the moment and it's always good to keep up that conversation and also speak amongst yourselves within within the, 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 the comment section. So the first question I have is for uh, Kawana and it's 
What are the best ways that social workers around the world can show solidarity with refugees in Greece and elsewhere? And with that, what can we do to defend social work, uh, social work rights, defend refugee rights? Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, so what are the best ways that social workers around the world can show solidarity with refugees in Greece and elsewhere? And with that, what can we do for refugee rights? As you know, the refugee crisis is not a modern crisis. It is not something that all the people or the world may know about it. And those that they are taking action, believe me that they are facing too many troubles and they are like dealing with many challenges, especially if a activist is among the refugees own. For instance, when I started like taking action as a refugees right, like human rights activist, especially for the refugees, it was really hard for me being in, the, in, a, commu in a community that they are totally against the activities of a woman and also acting in a, commu in, in a local community that a lot of people are not really aware about the background of refugees and the refugees are getting judged by the local community as they are not living together with, uh, with each other. So the main important, so there are three stages that we can make change. The first one is to wear awarenesses, like to, to share the awarenesses, to share the information, to open the discussion, to speak or to also like bring the refugees on and the panelists. We have been represented by the others uh, for many years. And this is the main reason that we are still not really known. And our background is something that, you know, others are speaking about it. And we haven't been able to speak like directly about the reason we had to flee our country and the reason that we are living here, the problems that we are facing here, the challenges that we had to come over uh, while passing the borders. So I think, the main uh, affection can come from those that they are sharing this awareness is that those that they are opening this uh, discussion in the universities with their friends with those that they are living uh, like in the same community because uh, as we spoke about the climate change i think many of people are now interested to take actions about uh, uh, you know the climate justice but we can see less people, even among the young refugees own, there are not many people who may stand defend their rights because the refugee apply and our, you know, the asylum applies a threat for each refugee. And we, we can be threatened by this, uh, um, by our asylum apply very uh, easy, easily and very fast. So that's why uh, you are witness that you can see that all, a lot of refugees are silent because we are all afraid of our uh, getting rejected by the country that we are living in. And for many of us, uh, staying in suppression and repression is, uh, uh, you know, preferable in, or in, in, like uh, uh, according to the condition that we are forced to leave. And, uh, you know, for many of us, it is better to stay silent in order to not get uh, rejected. And, but those that they are able and they have the power to empower others and those that they are able to stand the, to defend our rights so they can share their information, they can aware others, they can, you know, they can let the refugees to, rep uh, to present themselves. Because if we have the voice to speak, then why others should speak instead of us and in the alpha of us? Well, what, yeah, what, what a fantastic answer. And, and it's worth knowing to yourself um, on the comment section on Facebook and in YouTube, there's been so much solidarity with, with refugees and, and, and the, the situation in terms of how, people, how the camps and how various uh, different situations uh, housing situations has actually left people in dire situations at the moment. Um, so I'm going to come to Michelle next. Um, and Michelle, how can social work academics carry out community-based research when in the UK and elsewhere there is great pressure only to carry out research that comes with large research grants? Uh, yeah, that's like the million dollar question, right? Um, 
the university systems are completely caught up with capitalism and trying to get big grants just to just to stay alive. I admittedly do not swim in those particular uh, particular waters. Um, I swim in the waters where I'm an educator and a, a lecturer. And I think tenured people, the consciousness there, the consciousness raising um, there, uh, needs to be quite high across many different university systems. I do believe that at Boston University, we are now at the School of Social Work prioritizing um, how we actually, uh, our strategic plan is to dismantle injustice and liberate possibilities and definitely deepening into the waters of how they do community-based uh, participatory research is usually how it's called. And I think Autumn went one step further last night in challenging us around decolonizing methodologies where how is the community actually in the lead and speaking for themselves precisely also as Parwana just said to I mean the the, I, the communities are the experts the people being impacted are the experts um, the poor people's campaign uh, in the United States lifts that up routinely um, let the people who are being impacted speak for themselves there's no reason they need to be mediated by me uh, as a white person, you know, I did that in my book when I studied a particular community. I tried to figure out how could I do decolonizing approaches, but I wasn't even equipped well enough at the time for that because it's not the standard uh, of research practice. So um, it's certainly something that has to come from within the universities in terms of the pressures within the system by the faculty themselves in how to engage this work in a different way and to see the wisdom. Uh, of doing that. And we don't have a lot of time as Michael so brilliantly spoke to. Um. Thank, thank you again. So I'm getting loads of messages with loads of contributions and questions and, and, and messages of solidarity. So I'm, I'm all over the place trying to keep up with it, which is fantastic, Always not, never a bad problem. Um, I'm going to come to Michael. We've got a question from uh, Lynette Brignadello. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, how can we better the climate situation without extractivism in the global south? Many sustainable options for energy supplies need natural resources that are in our, our homeland, the global south. Okay, so um, I think, I, th I mean, the answer to that question, I think, is that we have to look um, at, at appropriate uh, plans for what I would call the Green New Deal. Um, and I think with uh, joined up thinking, we can, you know, we can address the questions of unemployment and poverty by creating jobs in areas that are about sustainable and uh, green recovery programmes. Um, it means that we shouldn't be opening up jobs in the coal extractive industries, uh, but we should be creating jobs in those communities that are sustainable in and of them, in and of themselves. Uh, the, the the crisis, the the, the climate crisis is, is of such nature. Um, you know, there's a, there's a saying in the climate movement that actually the best time to start making the changes that we urgently need was probably about 30 years ago. But the second best time is today. Um, we are absolutely under, you know, huge pressure as a human species, if you like, to get this right and to address this. So we need, um, we cannot leave this to the market. We cannot leave it to global capital. We cannot leave it to market competition. We need planned, uh, economic, green-focused recovery, which takes people out of poverty, but does so in a way which uh, builds, um, you know, a, public transport systems rather than private cars that makes uh, homes uh, that are um, appropriately built, uh, insulated, uh, that need less heating. We need, um, uh, you know, we need huge investment in these areas. Um, but the world has never been more wealthy. We have huge amount of resources at our disposal. We can do this, but it needs to be planned and it needs to be focused on creating jobs, taking people out of poverty, and in the process of doing that, focusing on a better relationship with our ecological system and taking the carbon out of the atmosphere uh, by having a green recovery program. So I'm not sure if that answers it, but hopefully it gives some of the indication, Rory. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure people can come, come back into that. And later on, I'll, I'll come back to that question or, or comment on Michael's 
contribution there. Hey, I'm just going to come back to yourself, Pawana, um, and we've got a contribution and a question from Joanna Avan Avanitake, I think is how it's pronounced, I'm not too sure. Um, what do you think would be best practice to empower resistance? What would be the main contribution to your fight nowadays during the pandemic and in general? First of all, I really thank to all those that they are sending their messages of solidarity to us. And it is really emotional to get this because, you know, uh, when we are, I had some conversation with politicians when they are telling us that the citizens are not, like the communities are not able to, are not ready to accept the refugees. But we know that every day a lot of people are protesting and they are taking actions, they are standing uh, you know, in protest, they are demonstrating, they are like making a lot of programs, standing in solidarity with us, sharing their message with us, making like uh, a lot of uh, you know, programs and in many different ways, having like a political influence in order to make it happen. And they are every day sending their message, the refugees are welcome. This is really a strong. This is the meaning of hope for us. And one of the main ways is to have political influence. You have your municipalities, you have, uh, uh, you know, you have the parliaments in your country, you are in the cities that you are able to have political influence, to speak with those that you know that they are able to make change. So do that. And the time is today, because the pandemic has made the refugees the, as like the most vulnerable group, but also the, the most hidden uh, part of the community because the refugee camps are constructed in the places that we are not able to communicate with uh, with other people. The camps are constructed in a way uh, that can be controlled well. We are under control and this control is getting more and more because every time that more rules and restrictions are coming on us and we accept that, we face with more than that. So this is not going to be end up if you stay silent. To be honest, your silence like, counts the value of our life. So if you think that things are going on right, so you can stay silent, you can do nothing. And this is the silence of other people that they are in power that tell us that what is going on in our life is right and it should be continued. What is happening on us is right and should be continued. And everything that we are suffering in is right and should be continued. So if it is something like this, then the, condi the condition should be continued like this. And don't forget that in this condition, a lot of people are losing their life. And we are speaking about the life of human beings, that they are losing them in the Mediterranean, in the Asian Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea. So it is not about, uh, it is, not something to uh, wait for it for tomorrow or to you know or to wait for the opportunities to uh, to make it happen it, it a miracle is not going to happen if we cannot have the solidarity so to speak with your municip municipalities send the letters w like ask the lawyers ask those that they are uh, specialists in the uh, refugee crisis and they are working with refugees or defending their rights because uh, in this condition we are thinking ourselves as the as the most alone group of people when I mean, we are even not able to communicate and every time every every day more repressions and legislations are that are getting changed we are thinking that we are really alone in this way so Hope that the condition will be changed soon and we will have more solidarity and more, more sentence that says the refugees are welcome. Thank you, Pawana. And that actually falls quite nicely into a question from Michelle, um, from Camila Filo. Um, the resistance is an ethical choice um, for social workers. So how can we deal with oppression coming from social policies within our countries? I think I got it. Yeah, there we go. Um, can you just repeat the question one more time, Rory? Sorry, I know I talk fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
The resistance is an ethical choice for social workers. So how can we deal with oppression coming from the social policies of our countries? So that's a broad question in terms of context. I think um, we all need to get very skilled as social workers with engaging a power analysis and the cultural dimensions of that. So how do we look at our organizations that we're working in? How do we do advocacy at the state and the national levels, whichever country um, we're in the political system? How do we engage in a very clear analysis of where are the resources? Who's making decisions? And this goes back also to the university uh, question in terms of accessing power within a university system. Who has the roles that make particular decisions, okay? So who are the pivotal people who are going to be able to direct resources or do the kinds of, make the kinds of changes? And then what are the cultural norms and standards that are, that are um, happening in any particular context? So that's true for doing advocacy at state house. Um, in United States context, we, social workers need to be trained in a lot of um, political skills and analysis, and we gotta have the analysis and we gotta be able to do power mapping uh, of everything. Um, you know, and that, that comes from a lot of activist um, traditions and feminist uh, traditions in terms of how to do uh, cultural power analysis and, um, and that. So, um, and we need to take care of ourselves. So the other dimension is like, how do, does each of us care for ourselves in that process. And we have different levels of power and privilege depending on the embodied identities that we carry that may demand that some of us need to engage in an even deeper level of trauma informed self care and, and communal care uh, in this process. So how do we know also in terms of resisting individualism, particularly for those of us white, it's like, it's not all on us. It's not all an individual project. How do we organize for change? So. I'm part of the labor struggles within the university context and in my other, and they're also involved deeply in policy advocacy in the United States context. And also my Unitarian Universalist tradition is deeply involved in policy activism and voting rights and all of those things. So hopefully that answers, it was a broad scope question, so. Thank you. And <laughs> to Michael then, I suppose, <laughs> Yeah, this is interesting because quite a few questions are following on from one another and it's how do we deal with the possible contradictions under capitalism as social work uh, as being part of uh, and contributing to the oppression and to the problems and that's from, from Ricardo Peterini. Okay Ricardo, um, good, good question Ricardo um, and one that I think radical social workers have um, have grappled with for, for, for many years. Um, and in the, in the 1960s and the 1970s, this was sometimes um, summarized as being in and against the state. Um, of course, we are employed in social work organizations and agencies. Uh, sometimes those are uh, state agencies, sometimes those are voluntary sector organizations. And that does bring uh, tensions. Uh, so how do we operate to make sure that we are on I suppose we are finished. How do we make sure that we are on the right side in those big questions? I think there's a couple of uh, answers uh, to that. First of all, I think um, it is that we always point towards the collective. Radical social work is not about martyrs. Um, you know, I sometimes say to my, my students, um, you know, if you want to be a radical social worker, the first thing you do is you don't go into your first job in the first day, kick the boss's door down and say, it's time for you to leave. We are now in charge because you'll probably get the sack. Um, but it's about making sure that you link with other people, that you join your appropriate trade union, that you take place in workplace meetings, that you start to build the resistance at the low level, um, it, you know, it, if most of your colleagues don't have a lunch break, well then let's take your lunch. It's part of your, your, your rights and responsibility. Use that time to have discussions about what, what you're doing so that you build a culture in the workplace amongst your workers of challenging the policies that are put in place. And then uh, um, the question that was asked earlier, I suppose about ethical choices. I, I actually don't think this is about ethical choices. I think this is about ethical requirements. Uh, as social workers, we are clearly committed 
to a notion of human liberation and meeting human need. And as collectively organised social workers, we join with the service user organisations in our communities, in our services, and we join with them and fight for better services. And it seems to me that that's, it's, not a, it's not a quick fix, but it's what we have to aim to do. It's about empowering the communities, working in solidarity with the communities and looking after yourself as a worker in that process of bringing about a different and a better social work. Thanks, Michael. And I think uh, come back to Pawana, I've actually got a couple. A couple one's a, a solidarity message. Um, your contribution today uh, is very powerful and shows that refugees are not simply victims, but have agency, power, and can resist. Um, so I think you're you're being asked, would you would you come and speak at other um, webinars to do with radical social work around the world? So we can we can hopefully link you up with other groups to come and discuss the situation. But the question to yourself um, is really about how can so, or, or can the social movements uh, contribute to, to the refugee struggle? Um, and is this happening in Greece at the moment? Uh, sorry to ask again, but I couldn't understand the last part because the connection was cut out. Ah, right, okay. Um, the, the, the question is, can the social movements contribute to the refugee struggle? And is this happening in Greece at the moment? Mm -hmm. In Greece, we are like the social workers are struggling with many, uh, with many angles and as aspects because it is not only like dealing with what is going on because, you know, every day, the number of the refugees and migrants that are coming to Europe is going on and it is raising up. And this makes the condition for everybody very hard, but also, uh, the movement, like the movement of social workers, is uh, especially in making is change is uh, uh, to change the perspective of the local community, because there are fascist groups that they are um, that they have taken many actions in order to you know in order to repress the right of the refugees and to repress so to say the humans right, and they have been standing in solidarity with refugees and others uh, in order to you know, stop these actions from a uh, fascist group. But also mm, uh, in another way was to, uh, you know, sh mm, to share awareness about the condition of refugees and to make a new uh, like perspective of others about refugees by putting them in the panels, by like giving them the chance to speak, by, you know, making uh, social and uh, um, so to say, totally uh, festivals and programs for them in order to uh, um, communicate with other people, but also to, to have some affections and to impact on the laws uh, from the state and government. So one of the biggest struggles that they are nowadays facing is with the uh, laws and restrictions, with the legislations that every day is, uh, uh, is changed and they are, and it is getting more restricted for the refugees. So, of course, it is hard because everybody is uh, dealing with this crisis, even the community. But uh, the main demand and the main struggle is for them to show that the community is uh, standing on the same line when the legislation is repressing both sides. Um, I hope I could give the answer. I think you've given so many great <laughs> answers today, um, and yeah, I think I think part part a great thing of always being involved with the uh, Social Work Action Network is that we've always had a strong campaign for refugees, whether it be the Care Care for Cali campaign, or whether it be standing in solidarity in anti-racist movements, anti-fascist movements, like our comrades have in, in Greece against Golden Dawn. Um, over, over the years. We've had quite a lot of questions regarding uh, social work education, Michelle, so I'm trying to put these into one. Um, but this one comes from uh, Sheila Avisa. Um, social work education in Canada are greatly lacking in curriculum are greatly lacking in curriculum on political action, organization, advocacy, etc. What can students and faculty do to challenge us? And hamming in another question is, you know, what, what can we do to, 
to stop education and on, on, and workplaces reduce the political elements of social work. Okay, I may need you to repeat the second one again, but let me just say for the first one, um, I, I do think there's a lot of basic core material out there about power analysis, power mapping, cultural power mapping. And I think the Boston Liberation Health Group that I'm a member of and Don Belkin Martinez um, is a founder of, who's part of the SWAN network is an excellent resource, um, um, not to put Don and the group on the spot for having people come out and lead workshops. I know she's led workshops um, using her particular um, tool and diagram for liberation health uh, to help um, uh, build skills for uh, social work st students and how to integrate the clinical and the macro and how to do that level of you know institutional and um, cultural uh, analysis. So. I definitely recommend the Boston Liberation Health Group uh, workshops um, to travel. Um, they've traveled to New York and many other places and parts of the country, but um, perhaps they can take a trip to Canada uh, sometimes. But the book is available. There, there, there is a book, there is a website. If you just Google um, the Boston Liberation Health um, Group, you'll find the Facebook group and also the website for a lot of resources. And um, there's lots of different resources on power analysis and power mapping available too. What was the second part of the question? Um, no, I'm trying to remember myself. Um, how can we challenge um, the elements in education where they try to take away the political element of social work? It's a, yeah, it, it, it's interesting because um, you need allies exactly as what Michael was saying. This is a collective effort. So you've got to build in your schools, allies. You gotta know who your allies on the faculty are. Um, and if you don't have allies, you need to kind of reach out into the community and create a, a network of allies because it can be challenging, particularly for some social work schools. I have a luxury at the School of Social Work at Boston University where a lot of the faculty are already on board with more um, uh, anti-capitalism, radical ways of thinking and all of these different things and they're built, you know, continuing to build that structure. And particularly we have Dawn on faculty uh, there now. Um, so, so it helps. Um, yeah, I just think you got, you, got to, you got to find allies in the school and also um, on the ground. Okay, thanks so, thanks so much, Michelle. And, and actually someone's just came in and a comment on Canada, uh, Bessa Whitmore, um, and they say years ago when Michael spoke at our annual social work conference in Canada, we started a social work action network group there. Um, sadly, it didn't last as far as I know. And puts a, puts a suggestion out, why don't we start a social work action network group in Canada, which I would wholeheartedly concur with. Um, I'm going to come to you, Michael. Um, and... The, the question here, um, I haven't got a name, but it is how can we break with the individualism of traditional social work and get collective community uh, work approaches back on the agenda in social work education, but also in social work? Okay, um, so let me let me um, try and address that um, in, in two ways. Um, first of all, um, you know, not in all parts of the globe, but certainly in the, the, the neoliberal heartlands, I suppose, in, in the UK and the US, perhaps in Canada, parts of Australia, the, there, is a, there, has been a, there has definitely been a shift towards a focus on more individual approaches and the marginalization of collective, of community and of campaigning models of social work. But if, the first thing I think that we should emphasize is that over the last year, during the COVID pandemic, those target setting individualist neoliberal models of social work completely and utterly were revealed as being totally out of their depth and completely inappropriate for the scale of the crisis that we were uh, facing. I think they've been completely exposed and we are now face, uh, we're now faced with an opportunity or there's an opportunity to, to rethink that agenda and to bring back the collective and the community and the campaigning models back into social work and, and, and re-centre a social work that is focused on those things. That's part of the argument, that's part of the task, I think, of people who are watching this video 
today or, or this webinar today are who are involved with SWAN, again, through their uh, union organisations, through their, you know, their academies and all the rest of it. We need to put the argument forward. And the second thing that's connected with that is that what's become absolutely clear, I think, in the various webinars that SWAN has organised over the last year is that there are large parts of the world um, where, uh, where those models are still there. Um, you know, we had a, a webinar several months ago where we had colleagues from Sierra Leone talking about the collective response and the community-based response that they operated around COVID. So we have got a lot of learning to do, I think, around those approaches. But we also, I think, are at a moment where we can push back against the sort of neoliberal um, uh, individual uh, individualistic uh, approaches that are dominating within, within uh, social work. But I wanted to say one other thing about that, because there's been quite a lot of um, questions about, you know, how do we, how do we import radical social work into the academy? How do we bolster radical social work within the academy or within the workplace? And um, on the one hand, of course, it's it's very important that we have radical ideas and books and uh, webinars and and all those things taking place to to take that argument forward, but I think there's something else. Um, when we look at the history of social work, my own view is that the radicalism in social work has not come from the minds or ideas of a few radical academics and intellectuals. Actually, the radicalism in social work has come from the social movements for change. It was the women's movement, the gay liberation movement, the anti-racist movement. It is them that have challenged societies and forced social work to confront issues of racism and anti-racism, of uh, women's control of their reproductive rights, of uh, uh, gay liberation. And so it's the, the movements that is the generator of those demands. And I suppose my final thing to say, therefore, would be if we want to think about the collective and social work, if we want to think about bringing the radicalism back into social work, the best thing for all of us to do would be to immerse ourselves in the movements for social change and celebrate social work as a political project and a political activity. Can I just, just like so wholeheartedly send big hearts out for what you just said, Michael, because change comes from the ground up. Okay, and it's really like, you know, Push it on, yeah. And that's exactly like that Chris Cross book I mentioned earlier, documents a lot of that in a global context too. Well, we're coming to the end of um, our, our first session at the, at the International Conference. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone. Oh, pawana has got a hand up and I would absolutely love to bring you back in actually. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the information that you gave, and, and, and like especially about the movement that you mentioned. My question is that how can we treat a crisis like a crisis? Because in many ways, we don't know that it is getting changed to a crisis, especially like for us refugees, that we know that the condition is getting worse and worse, as we know about the countries. And when we look at up, look at back to our country, and we see that the you know the pandemic is affecting on that the. Uh, Eastern and Western of, uh, attacks is affecting on that. And, uh, you know, uh, so we know that more people are going to come. And we know that at the moment we are stuck here and uh, we are dealing with a lot of problems. In another way, we are not able to act. We are not able to speak. So how can we uh, defend and how can we be a part of uh, showing this condition as a crisis? Because, you know, you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Michela, you mentioned about the indigenous uh, uh, group and you mentioned about, the, uh, about them, but what would you expect them to do for themselves, you know? And it is the same question that I have. Uh, what the house world expect us to do something for us? Because, you know, we are also those people that we had jobs in our country. We are also those people that we were, some of us were graduated from universities. So we know the problem, something that we can not, elaborate and we cannot like analyze or act for that or you know make impact on that that we cannot act you know we cannot mm, we cannot speak out so how can we make it change like how can we be a part of this change if we are not able to do that yeah thank you for the pushback um parwana because it's also it's the change from the ground up but it's also the top the top down meeting and taking in your very passion and and witness, right? And allowing our hearts and 
minds to be engaged, like people who hold power, right? There, there's both end of the gatekeepers and having people positioned as gatekeepers who also help to affect the change and get the communities, the resources, access to resources um, that they need. So I think it's, it's a both end of, of meeting um, somehow, but you do need people who are in those positions who actually can hear and have hearts and ears to hear. And, and, and I'm sorry to say it this way, but I'm a working class clergy person, give a friggin' damn, right? And, and allow their hearts to be open to compassion, right? And the very passion and compassion, you know, that you're, you're demonstrating. So thank you. Thank you for your witness and your testimony. Thank you. I think everyone um, should come back in that question, actually, because it's such an important one, Pawana. Um, you know, it, it, solidarity around the world does occur often. Um, and, you know, we've seen the growth of the United Nations uh, International Day of Anti-Racism, but actually it has to be much more grounded, much more thorough. Um, I know within my, my own trade union, Unison, we do stuff through Social Work Action Network, we do stuff within political campaigns, we do stuff, but it has to be more ingrained in the day to day because, you know, it's, it's not just a, a fight for yourselves, you know, it, it's a fight that we have to take to our governments about the policies, the legislation and, and the situations that they are putting in that are caused by a lot of our, our actions in the Middle East or Africa. I'm going to bring Michael in just to come back as well, actually. Okay, Th thanks Rory. Um, yeah, good question and, and it kind of relates to one of the comments I think that was in uh, the Facebook feed earlier on and it said, you know, that we're all involved in these small scale struggles and how do we stop them being um, being beaten and I suppose it, it, it's, it's that, how do we join our struggles together? Um, and I, I suppose that's what this weekend is about. This weekend is about thinking about the connections and the interconnections and the debates that we uh, want to have. We want to throw open that debate to everybody that's here over the weekend and, and see where it takes us. My own view is that, um, you know, and it may mean different things in different parts of the world, but I would describe myself as a, as a socialist. And when I think about it, I sometimes think about it as your hand, that we have all separate struggles so we have refugee rights and we have women's rights and we have lgtb rights and we have workers rights and we have anti-racism and if we're all isolated and on our one hand all these strands it's easy for us to be picked off so under the socialist movement we've always said that we have to bring them together and as we bring them together they become a strong fist and united we can win The Poor People's Campaign and Fusion Politics. That's what that's all about too. Totally, thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you everyone. I, I do have to bring the session to an end. Unfortunately, like any good conversation or, or where things are being discussed, you do have to bring them to end at some point, which is a real shame. However, this is a weekend of discussion and a weekend of debate where everyone can partake in and we do ask you to continue to, to engage with us, get involved in the live streams, attend the meetings, Go to the spotlight videos that are going to be released on Facebook and YouTube that have got more in-depth kind of interviews with certain speakers on certain topics, for instance, like Ian Angus on, on, on the climate emergency. Um, and I would say to yourselves, um, if you are participating, please check your emails because I will be sending out emails frantically, no doubt, throughout the conference, just with information or, or, or things that need to, I need to make you aware of in terms of meeting speakers or offers. So please check your emails and get in touch with us. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone. And like um, Bessa said, in terms of the Canadian um, social workers, if you've not got a social work action network group in your local, set one up, contact us and join the international network of radical social work. There's people on the, the social media saying we need more interaction, we need more radical social work universities. And that starts the universities and it starts with us and it starts now. So join SWAN and thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Rory, for all that you did in organizing this. And thank you, Parwana, so deeply. Okay, and Michael, thank you. Thank you very much for opening the discussion. It is really important to have on the world, like, and to have all the perspectives and to have uh, the voices who are speaking, not the representatives who are presenting. So, thank you very much for this opportunity, and thank you very much for answering the questions. And I feel really honored to.
be in this, this discussion with you. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Michelle and Mr. Michelle. Michael. <laughs> okay. Michelle and Frank. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, and Pawana definitely will be staying in touch um, with yourself and our daughter. Speaks with you. Thank you 